Yep, I'm heartbroken. For the families of the precious little girls stabbed to death at a Taylor Swift dance class in broad daylight in Southport yesterday. But trust me, I'm much more furious than upset. We cannot keep on going like this. Again and again, tragedy after tragedy, cold-blooded murder after cold-blooded murder, with more platitudes, more weasel words, more talk of not looking back in anger, and insistence that today isn't the moment for politics or hard discussions. And then the news cycle moves on, leaving devastated families to pick up the pieces as the gormless and weak politicians are able to avoid answering the hard questions about what they are doing to our country. Well, I am done with that. Enough is enough. We are importing extremism into our streets to the point where our children are not safe at a Taylor Swift dance class. It cannot go on. So I want to say sorry to six-year-old B.B. King. Your country has let you down. And what an adorable little girl she was. Sorry too to Elsie Sancombe a seven-year-old with a bright smile and an even brighter future. Your country has let you down. And sorry too to Alice Agua, nine years old, also stabbed to death in broad daylight yesterday. Our politicians will still not talk about what we all know resulted in this massacre, mass immigration and the failure of multiculturalism. What else explains a 17-year-old teenager with Rwandan parents causing terror at a dance class that he knew would be attended by young girls? Assimilation is failing and our streets are no longer safe. Now, I appreciate many might criticise me for talking about this today, but I am so sick of these issues being swept under the carpet and conveniently being blamed on mental health or knife crime. The Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, who has overseen a reign of terror on our streets since taking the job, pulled out all the usual lines today. What should have been a, a children's party having fun in the beginning of the summer holidays could then turn into something so devastating. There's obviously deep concern about uh, knife attacks across the country and that's why the Prime Minister has said that that is a moral mission to address this. But I think for today the issue really is about Southport and the issue is about the families who have been affected uh, in this case and all of us praying for the injured children and for for the little children who have been lost. I know we're running really tight on time, but I just want to quickly ask you, Home Secretary, is there anything else you can tell us about the perpetrator? For example, were they known to the authorities? Well, Merseyside Police are leading this extremely important and serious criminal investigation. This was a horrific attack and they need to be able to get on with that work and they will provide us with updates. You'll understand that uh, others uh, should not be uh, speculating or commenting in advance of those updates and we really welcome the work of Merseyside Police. But it's also important that they pursue every single angle uh, of inquiry. Oh yes, let's not speculate. Let's just follow the narrative. And all of those sorts of lines were repeated by Keir Starmer in a meaningless interview later on. So no wonder he was heckled as he made a surprise visit to the Southport massacre site today to lay flowers. How many more children have died on our streets, Prime Minister? How many more children? How many more children, Prime Minister? Are we going to do something? Time to change, Starmer. Come on, it's needed. How many more children? Is it mine next? What's changed for? Bye bye. You got your photos, off you go. Make a real change, Prime Minister. Make a real change! Our children! Go away! I've just found out my friend's nine-year-old girl. Good on those people. 
Now, I don't know if you could hear it at the end there, but there was one woman who said she had just found out her friend's nine-year-old child had been stabbed. So I feel and I completely understand the visceral anger from those patriots. And I actually believe it needs to be harnessed responsibly to force real change. I want to contrast two different reactions today. Scotland's failed ex-First Minister, whom's a useless, posted this on X. He wrote, simply awful. Our only response to the evil we witnessed in Southport yesterday should be an outpouring of grief for the children and adults killed in such a senseless attack. If you use such a tragedy to fuel bigotry, then you are the worst kind of humanity. But contrast that to the Neighbours actress, Holly Candy, a mum who now lives in London. She wrote on the same platform, lay awake all night next to my babies weeping. Could have been any of us. We're actually done for here. Wake up, leave the ECHR, arm police, bring back capital punishment, grow an effing pair. We are weak as piss and the media needs to stop shoving a bunch of DEI shit down everyone's throats. You're destroying the nation. I know who I'm with. Talk of unity and the community coming together and holding our families closer is all completely futile. When three little girls are stabbed to death at a dance class, enough is enough. We are done. To react now, let me bring in today's superstar panel. And today I am joined by the husband and wife duo, Neil Hamilton. He is the former leader of the UKIP party and Christine Hamilton, author, political commentator, entertainer, raconteur and so much more besides. It is great to have you here both today, but obviously in the most terrible circumstances, Neil, and I'm angry. Yeah, well, you're right to be angry. And the last thing we want is politicians like Starmer and Yvette Cooper weeping their crocodile tears and wringing their hands uselessly whilst mouthing platitudes when, as the people, the real people on the street were uh, angry and, and, and entitled to be, they really knew that these people are never going to do anything practical to sort out the problem of knife crime, which is running riot, not just in Merseyside, but throughout our big cities all throughout the country. You know, people like Starmer, who was, let's never forget, director of public prosecutions for many years, and like all lefty lawyers, is fundamentally weak need on crime and punishment. These are the people who are actually responsible, ultimately, for events such as that which has happened in Southport in the last 24 hours. So what we want is real action, tough action, to punish and deter those who might be... Uh, inclined to carry out these grotesque acts. Christine, where are you at today? Angry or devastated? Well, both. Um, if this had happened in London, people would be saying, this is what happens in London. But the fact that it's happened in a, a small, relatively small seaside town where people go to have fun on their holidays, enjoy the beach, makes it somehow worse because things like that don't happen in Southport. They happen in London, but they don't happen in Southport. So I think that spreads it out. And I can't help thinking, and I'm sure everybody else in a similar position, of the little girls I know who are about that age. And you think it could have been them. And it is time to do something. We cannot just sit back and let this happen. This would never have happened. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, the England that I grew up in, this would never have happened. It didn't happen. A murder was the most incredibly, mm -hmm. almost never, ever event. Now, it's all too often happening. And look where it's coming from. Look at the perpetrators, generally speaking. And we can't go on brushing this under the carpet, but I, whether I'm angry or sad, I, it, it's almost unbelievable. I mean, how those parents and families are going to come to terms with what's happened I I just don't know I mean people die every day children die every day for different reasons but to die 
at the hands of a a, a madman. He must be mad. Um, there's no excuse. I'm not excusing him in any shape or form, but no sane person would do that. The thing is, Neil, this is where the mental health issue can be a difficult one because, yep, clearly anyone who goes in and stabs 11 young children and their teachers at a Taylor Swift dance class, well, of course they are mad. But Neil, can we also just be honest about the fact that a lot of these people do have an ingrained hatred of our country, of our society, and of our way of life? And simply because this man was born in this country doesn't necessarily mean that he has assimilated because we are increasingly seeing a failure, Neil, of multiculturalism. Yeah, of course, we see that most spectacularly in the case of murders and other crimes that are committed in the cause of radical Islam. Now, we've no idea whether there's anything uh, involved with that in this particular example, maybe not, as the family from, from Rwanda. But nevertheless, what we have seen in the last 20 or 30 years in particular is the gradual fracturing of society and uh, uh, the destruction of what was, as Christine said, in the decades where we grew up, a fundamentally wholly co cohesive society where we all had the same norms of conduct. We had uh, respect for the police and uh, the organs of authority that has very largely gone certainly from the centers of our great cities today that you see feral populations uh, at the weekend in particular people behaving in the most appalling way and we see a dramatic rise in crimes related to um, knives uh, and the prevalence of knives amongst young people today is something which is wholly horrifying and in our days was completely unknown absolutely totally unknown in the 1950s and the 1960s and yet now it's tolerated even if it's not condoned uh, you know what we need is to bring back stop and search powers in particular to begin with uh, and they were of course removed because they were regarded as racist in the hands of the police and that of course brings us back to the question which you posed it is where um, identity politics has actually taken over from what was at one time, a wholly cohesive society where we all behaved largely in the same way and had the same broad hopes and aspirations, shared a loyalty to the crown, to our country, to our institutions, were not ashamed of our history and uh, were proud of what we had brought to the world. You know, that has been destroyed by uh, politicians of all the main parties, actually, either by commission or omission. The Tories have been fantastically useless at standing up to these trends. And in fact, they are part of the problem, not the solution, which is why, of course, they were so spectacularly booted out on the 4th of July. Uh, so, you know, there has to be a fundamental change in the political uh, system in this country in order to put the people back in charge, because the elites have let us down right, left and centre. Absolutely. And they are changing the demographics of this country completely against our will and look at the sorts of issues it's importing. With that, I couldn't agree more. Christine, can we just talk a little bit about what happened at the site today? Because there was a fascinating change in tone over the past couple of hours. So we just saw the footage there of Yvette Cooper, the Home Secretary arriving to lay flowers in the morning and at that point it was exactly what she wanted everyone was quiet everyone was respectful she lay her flowers she left the scene she gave her interview full of platitudes afterwards but in the past hour Keir Starmer the Prime Minister arrived on site and faced something altogether different fury in the streets people who were asking him directly how many more children are going to die. People whose friends have lost relatives as a result on the streets yelling at him. Now, Christine, that is quite an extraordinary political moment. I'm almost certain the mainstream media will try and bury it. But I haven't seen that type of visceral anger so soon after a tragedy aimed at the Prime Minister of the day. No, well, he's about to discover, if he hasn't just discovered in the scene that you uh, outlined, that the buck stops with him. And the Home Secretary may be nominally responsible, but the buck stops with the Prime Minister. 
and he may say, oh, it's, you know, it's nothing to do with me. I've only been in office for three weeks, but he's got to stop this. And my fear is that it's too late to stop it. We have got, we have imported in various ways too many people who, as Neil said, they don't share our values, they don't share our norms, they don't share our history, they don't think the way that, that we think, uh, and they have completely not assimilated. Uh, and my fear is that there are so many of them here already that it is too late to turn back the tide. I mean, you know, good luck here, Stom. I want him to succeed. We all want him to succeed. He is the Prime Minister now and probably for the next five years at least. And if he doesn't succeed, if he can't do anything about it, then we're all going to be, these situations are going to be repeated and we're all going to be in this sort of state of anger and I think it's actually wrong to talk about grief. You can't have grief for somebody you don't know. Um, so it's anger and sadness, you know, incredible mm. sadness. But we, I think, job. Christine, what we can have grief for is the country that yeah, we absolutely. once knew yeah. exactly. and the country Where's that is being lost in so many ways. Yeah. Now, Neil, look. And why is it being lost? We all know why, yeah. don't we? Of course. Now, on that note, Neil, you know a lot about what Christine was just talking about because up until very recently you were the leader of the UKIP party and you had developed a very strong policy prescription about how you could stop illegal immigration. Now you will have seen what Keir Starmer's policy prescription is and Neil it's doomed to fail isn't it? He's put all of his stock on smashing the criminal gangs which is exactly what has been done for the past five years it's impossible to do that so it feels like by turning illegal immigration into a regular immigration labor is almost accepting that we are going to continue to have an invasion of our shores well they're either totally deluded or they're being dishonest probably a combination of both mm. you know, we've had a war on drugs for as long as i can remember uh, smashing the drug gangs has been one of the main aims of government's penal policy. That has been a total and absolute failure. All we do know about the drug gangs is they've now been taken over by illegal migrants. So you know, that, that I think sh shows you how effective Starmer's proposed policy on legal migration is going to be. No, their their, their uh, answer to solving illegal migration is to make all the illegals legal. To give them an amnesty. 100,000 of them are going to be given an amnesty, effectively. Uh, that's what, what they've announced already, and they've only been in office for three weeks. Uh, you know, we, we've, uh, we're adding three quarters of a million people to our population every single year at the moment through a combination of legal and illegal migration. That is bringing about massive structural changes to the population yes. of this country, and, and which will uh, be f felt for generations to come. And, you know, just the religious makeup of the country is changing out of all recognition. I, I took uh, advantage of uh, an hour before we came on air to look at the figures on, on the Muslim population of Britain, for example. Uh, in, in, uh, in England and Wales, between the 2010 census and the 2020 census, the, our population grew by three and a half million. Uh, and a third of that population growth was Muslims. So, you know, I'm not saying that most Muslims are not peaceable uh, and, and probably very decent people as much as you or I are. But nevertheless, the cultural norms yeah. that are going to be imposed upon the people of this country are very, very different from the ones that we grew yes. up. Because remember, Neil, the polls show when Muslim people are polled, and of course, this is their belief, so maybe it's not a surprise, but the majority of Muslims agree with Sharia law. The majority of Muslims agree that homosexuality should be illegal. I mean, I think it is fair to say that a large proportion of those arrivals into our country will not share many of our values and ethics, and that is part of the issue. Now, look, there's been some extraordinary media coverage over the past 24 hours, but I want to play you a particularly shocking moment from the British Bashing Corporation, who not only are trying to bury the real story, but what has happened to our public broadcaster? They can't even get basic facts right. So 
watch this extraordinary clip where a commentator, not challenged by the presenter, tries to equate what happened in Southport with Dunblane, which we all know was caused by gun violence, not knife crime. Watch what happened. I'll get you to react off the back. Daniel, mass stabbings in this country are extremely rare, aren't they? They are extremely rare. Um, obviously, we've had some very high profile mass stabbings uh, which have been linked to terrorism. And then we've had some uh, exceptionally distressing uh, mass stabbings, most infamously, of course, in, in Dunblane uh, back in uh, 1996, I believe that was. Um, when a, 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 a significant number of primary school children were stabbed to death uh, in a mass stabbing. But this is not something that is in any way common. And the, the number of uh, mass stabbings involving children uh, on this scale, really the only one I can immediately think of is the Dunblane primary school incident in 1996. I mean, Christine, they do not know what they're talking about. It, absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I don't know who he was, that fellow, but the fact that he doesn't know that Dunblane had absolutely nothing whatever to do with stabbings is extraordinary. And as you say, the BBC didn't push back at all. No, because she probably didn't know that it was wrong no. either. That's the problem, isn't it? These people are, are not rigorous journalists. And we know that the, the BBC peddles its own propaganda lines. It isn't actually a news corporation at all in uh, huge areas of policy, not least on climate change, where they are quite explicitly propagandists for uh, the alarmist view. Uh, and similarly with all the sort of liberal nostrums, whether it's from Brexit to knife crime, uh, you'll find the BBC completely in bed with the likes of Keir Starmer and Yvette Cooper in their um, North London uh, Islington mindset. Uh, that's part of the problem. That's why you know BBC viewing numbers, of course, have been plummeting because who wants to watch this nonsense? We never bother watching the BBC um, for the news anymore. Whereas at one time everybody turned on the, the news at six o'clock or nine o'clock, whenever it was, where uh, you had uh, uh, the old-fashioned kind of newscasters. Um, uh, and so the, the world has completely changed, and the BBC, I'm afraid, has changed much, much for the worse as a result. Mm. Maybe. Uh the less said about traditional BBC news anchors, the better today, given uh, the other issue that they're currently dealing with. But look, propaganda isn't just coming from the BBC. Now, there's been a lot of speculation that the public has actually been managed or nudged even by the police. So look at this tweet from Stephen Barrett, the eminent lawyer who wrote I have been privately contacted by a police officer which is rare for me and told that we are being told about the Southport what we're being told about the Southport stabbings is being managed and that their priority is that our response is managed innocent children are dead I do not need to be managed and then the conservative commentator David Atherton he actually has a whistleblower someone who he says is involved in this or has information on this, who went one step further. So he writes today, it appears Home Secretary Yvette Cooper is managing the release of information on the Southport murders. One of my followers, who is a former police officer, blows the whistle. And this former police officer wrote to David saying, I just read your recent post regarding Merseyside Police managing information. This is exactly what happened when I was in South Yorkshire Police with reference to the Rotherham Muslim grooming gangs. Thankfully, I served many years in Doncaster, so never worked in Rotherham, so had no dealings or involvement with the grooming gangs. However, I do remember one briefing where we were told not to inflame community tensions by not openly discussing the perpetrators were Muslims. No one, including our inspector or sergeants, agreed. This was a directive from the then Labour government. There were and still are a lot of good cops out there who are sick of being used and abused by politicians. It's a disgrace that this management of information is still going on across each and every force. So do you think we are being managed here in some way is that why we're never told the full story neil and is that why our politicians say things like today is not the day for politics when a no, tragedy yeah, like he, this occurs we just want facts don't we yeah, it's not exactly. politics yeah. it's facts i'm afraid yvette cooper's deep concern isn't enough is it who cares whether she's deeply concerned or not what we want is a penal policy which is going to produce <laughs> results and you're absolutely right you know the top brass in the police are fundamentally useless uh, and uh, they're completely signed up to the DEI agenda. You, you don't get promoted to the top ranks of the police unless you're uh, fully woke and uh, fully committed, at least 
uh, openly and outwardly to the agenda of the likes of Yvette Cooper and Keir Starmer. Uh, above the, uh, the rank of, uh, of superintendent or chief superintendent, you know, it's a completely different world and politics then rules the roost rather than fighting crime. And that's why the police have been so spectacularly useless at doing the job that we pay them for. You know, uh, they're all right for attending uh, gay rights parades and so on, but ask them actually to solve a crime and you can forget it, especially if it's what they call low-level crime and the disgraceful decision uh, to say that no crimes involving uh, amounts of money of less than two hundred pounds would be uh, shoplifting would be looked at uh, in future by police forces. Just tells you all you need to know about an organisation which is simply not fit for purpose. What about? You, oh, sorry, Christine. Well, I was just say you you mentioned Rotherham, and I forget now how many years ago that was, but it was absolutely scandalous that because of fears of racial tension and fears of fingering the wrong the wrong people they didn't kill that off much more quickly and so many girls could have been saved from the most horrendous experiences if only the police had been more upfront open and honest with us. and the authorities the authorities generally it wasn't just the police as, far, as i understand it as far as rotherham was concerned yeah. And the point about crime is that it affects most and worst the people who live in deprived communities. Well, indeed. In, in indeed. particular, uh, black on black crime is something that uh, you're not allowed to talk about today. And yet it, it is certainly true in parts of London that the people who suffer most from uh, knife crime uh, and other crimes of, of violence and extortion and so on are actually black people. Uh, and it's by the, those in their own communities who are exploiting them. But we can't talk openly about these things because our politicians uh, don't want that narrative to be discussed and the police are fully signed up to uh, suffocating uh, free discussion on these very important issues. If we can't discuss these issues honestly and freely, then we will never get to the bottom of the problem and solve it. Neil, lots of folk have messaged me privately today advocating for the return of the death penalty in cases like this. What do you think? Is it time? Well, I voted when I was a Member of Parliament back in the 80s and 90s, when occasionally there was a vote on capital punishment for the restoration of capital punishment as a um, you know, final uh, punishment in certain cases. Uh, a lot of the problems that occurred with miscarriages of justice in the 50s and 60s and before, of course, today would not have occurred because of the availability of DNA evidence and so on. Um, and every case has to be looked at on its individual merits, of course, as a lawyer, I fully understand that. But, but there are certain crimes which are so horrific and so uh, incontrovertibly uh, ascribed to the person who's been convicted but I do believe that a deterrent effect is necessary. It's very difficult after all these years, you know, 50 years, 60 years, uh, to uh, see uh, capital punishment being restored. I mean, there are all sort of practical <laughs> problems in doing that, if nothing else, as well as uh, the uh, spiritual and political uh, controversy that it would excite. But uh, I do believe that, uh, that removing the ultimate penalty of capital punishment has in a certain section of our community, devalued respect for life itself. Mm. Christine, kind of ch child, child killers, yeah. killers of police officers, do, do they deserve to be put to death, Christine? Well, I've, um, I've changed my view on capital punishment. I used to be against it because I thought it was quite wrong for the state to sanction the taking of life. Uh, but now, I'm afraid, I have changed my view and I think easier to establish without any question that somebody did it uh, because of DNA etc and if somebody is caught red-handed for want of another word I really don't see why I mean why should we put them up at her Maj his majesty's expense for the rest of their lives which in the I mean in the case of this guy is he 17 I think goodness knows how many years that'll be um, so I'm afraid I am in favour of it. Now, I don't think it'll ever happen because you'll never get it through the House of Commons. It would always be an issue of conscience. Obviously, it has to be because there are people who their conscience wouldn't let them vote for it. Um, but I 
can see. On the other hand, I have to say that having, having experienced at the hand of the courts in this country a miscarriage of justice, personally, there is always the danger of a miscarriage of justice. But I think that is so infinitesimally small. And where there is absolutely cast iron, cut glass evidence, why not, frankly? Mm. Why not? They just don't deserve to live. They do well, not. The, the guy who's done this uh, in Southport does not deserve yeah. to live. I mean, 17 years old, You obviously we can't assume anything as yet, but you would assume uh, he could end up spending the rest of his life in prison. That will cost us uh, tens of millions of pounds over mm. the course of his life. Now, I want to share a fascinating... Perhaps we could ex- send him back to Rwanda. Yes. <laughs> that would make sense, wouldn't up. it? That would make sense. I think we had a, I think we had a deal with them recently. Uh, now, look, I want to share a fascinating exchange that I had earlier with Duncan Bannantyne on X. He's, of course, the Scottish entrepreneur, businessman, uh, one of the original dragons. And I wrote, uh, so I I'd actually posted saying the victims were six, seven and nine. Platitudes of don't look back in anger are no longer good enough. I don't know about you, but I'm furious. Duncan then replied saying, I am too upset to be furious. I want to know why so I can understand it all, but I doubt it will ever make sense. I replied saying, I understand that, but if we don't start to get angry, this is going to happen again and again. I've had enough. He replied saying, I agree with you, Dan, but I don't know what we can do. Maybe we need to get together as a country and peacefully march on Downing Street to demand our political leaders put a stop to it. But then he wrote something that shocked me but surprised me, not in a negative way, in a positive way, in an ex post that sadly has now been deleted. Uh, this is what he had to say. I never really liked Tommy Robinson very much, but maybe he was right all along. Now, Christine, is it time for a bit of a reevaluation in the mainstream of Tommy Robinson and much of what he warned about? Of course, he was seemingly arrested after the very peaceful uh, Uniting the Kingdom march on Saturday in London. But is it right? I mean, clearly someone's got to Duncan and said, oh my God, you can't say that. You've got to delete it immediately. We know that happens when you're a celebrity. But to me, it was really interesting. Well, it's what he said. So it's obviously what he genuinely feels. The fact that he's deleted it now. um, Why not stand up for what you believe in, Duncan? I mean, what have you got to lose? You've made it. You've made lots of money. You've got a place, a position. That's what you think. Say it and stand by it. I mean, I found it really heartwarming, actually, to see all those Union flags and Union Jacks and St. George's flags in London the other day. Tommy Robinson, in a way, is his own worst enemy because he knew that by showing that video, he was almost taunting the police to arrest him, almost saying, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it, come on, get me. I wish he hadn't done it, because otherwise I think that rally, supported by so many people, was uh, a wonderful display. It's at last the Brits are fighting back against all these endless rallies and marches from um, the non-Brits, shall we say. So I'm sorry that he was arrested. Uh, goodness knows what will happen. I. I I always worry if he's in prison because he probably has a pretty grim time. We know he does. He's spoken about it. Um, so please, Tommy, next time, if you know you're not supposed to do something, for goodness sake, don't do it. But, you know, look at them all there. They're up on the screen now, wrapped in, in, in British flags. It was wonderful. Heartwarming. We should have been there. Yeah. Well, I mean, Tommy Robinson is an authentic uh, voice of the white working class. And, uh, of course, that's the one... Uh, segment of society that, that there's open season on amongst the metropolitan liberals and everybody else um, uh, it can be tolerated but uh, people like Tommy Robinson can't be tolerated you know and he's done some pretty silly things in the past and sometimes unpleasant things but if you look at what he's actually said there's stuff on YouTube and other platforms which I've uh, heard and seen over the years including uh, a speech that he made once to the Oxford Union, which is well worth uh, listening mm. to. You know, he's not a dimwit uh, by any means, but I'm afraid that by his conduct, he's made himself into a bit of a pariah, uh, whereas politics is about persuading people and uh, you know, getting yourself mm. into a position where you can actually do something about the mm. evils and ills which beset the nation. Uh, Tommy Robinson uh, did want to join UKIP at one time, and Gerard Batten, who was the leader of UKIP at the time, uh, was very keen to get him in. I said, well, there's 
very difficult to see how one could actually sell uh, somebody like Tommy Robinson and unless he addresses some of the problems which have made him into a, a prior in the past. And so it never happened. Uh, but uh, I don't believe that he should be demonised in the way he has been. He certainly shouldn't be targeted and, uh, uh, and uh, treated by the police in the way that he has been. There's undoubtedly he's been discriminated against by the police establishment as a deflection from their own failures, actually. That's what it's all about. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it, it, you know, to treat a, a peaceful rally of the kind that he has led more than once, and so, sometimes uh, the police heavy hand comes down upon him so that that's a news item to distract attention from the main story. Exactly. The establishment has wanted to shut him up for a long time. Uh, look, and, finally, and main, someone... Oh, sorry, Christine. So I was say, the, no, the, the mainstream media constantly call anything that he's involved with far right. Oh, yeah. No. What's wrong with patriotic? Exactly. Yeah, indeed, because they anyway, didn't describe I've... the rival march led by uh, Jeremy Corbyn as far left. A uh, couple yeah. of quick uh, breaking news stories that have also developed today, both, I think, have some relation, actually, to what's been going on in Southport. Firstly, Anjem Chowdhury jailed for life, not before time, Neil, but should he ever have been released? Yeah, yeah absolutely right. Yeah. And th this man is a self-confessed terrorist, in effect. And uh, you know, the, the poisonous uh, uh, things that he has said in the past about the society in which he has voluntarily chosen to live uh, are absolutely outrageous. No sane society could possibly allow a person such as Chowdhury to be at large in order to carry mm. on his destructive work. It Which he was for a long time, Christy. He was for a long time, as we know. And was it the Finsbury Park Mosque, I think, was it? Was that, that, that where place, he started? Where yeah. it all started. And this is all happening in plain sight, of course. This is, this is the, the, the true story behind all this. The establishment has known perfectly well what's been going on for decades. And it's been growing and getting worse year in, year out, decade in and decade out. Until we've got to the stage now where we have perhaps several hundred thousand people who share his worldview uh, in uh, nestled in our big cities in the United Kingdom. And uh, as Christine was saying earlier on, what can we now do about it to change the structure of our population for, for the better? There's nothing in practice that we can do. Uh, all we can do is control the way in which people like Chowdhury uh, behave. And if they step out of line in a way which is criminal, then we make sure they're prosecuted and they are banged up for as long as is necessary. I mean, he should have been banged up ages ago. People yes, just put foot around it because they're terrified of being accused of racism. Yeah, which yeah is or Islamophobia. Or Islamophobia. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, if you then, or I behaved like he did, we wouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Well, no. And speaking of the most appalling behaviour, and the reason I'm so angry about this one today, and I usually hate giving these people attention but the reason i am so mad right is because i don't think our police are particularly well managed at the moment but you see how brave they are at an event like yesterday in in uh southport and you know that they need to be focusing on that rather than focusing on joey barton's tweets or the absolute despicable idiots from just stop oil so i want oh, to talk to you yes. about phoebe Plummer. And this is the Just Stop Oil activist who right now is likely to be thrown in jail. She had already been told to prepare for jail after throwing soup over Vincent van Gogh's sunflower, uh, sunflowers at National Gallery in central London. She then glue her, glued her hands to the wall beneath it and the judge was absolutely furious. But while awaiting sentencing, she decided to cause chaos today at Heathrow. Why has she been stopped? Where are the airport police? 
Well, exactly, Christine. Sorry, I was just hearing you there. Sorry, Why? I didn't know where well, no, no, no. I, it was, exa it was exactly police? my thinking. This is Heathrow Airport. What yes. if she were a terrorist? Would she just be allowed to do that? At an American airport, you would probably be shot. I mean, yeah. utterly furious about it. But then, uh, look at and how was, she... Sorry, you go... That, well, that was, that's Phoebe Plummer, is it? Who's yes. awaiting sentence already? Yes, 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 yes. And this oh, is her video where she spoke about why she was doing it today. My name's Phoebe. I'm 22 and I'm from London. And today I took action with Just Stop Oil because I cannot bear to stand by and do nothing while some massive harm of the climate crisis unfolds. Earlier this year, an IPCC scientist was quoted saying, I expect a semi-dystopian future with substantial pain and suffering to the people of the global south. The world's response to date is reprehensible. We live in an age of fools. We know what this means, that continuing to burn fossil fuels is murderous and it is racist. Yes, it's racist. Yeah, of well, course it's, it's racist. It's black, you know. <laughs> and oil is black when it comes out of the ground. I mean, so, I've uh, heard it all now, but yeah. look at the age she is. What did yeah. she say? 22. 22 she 22, has yeah. been... 22 going on three. ...indoctrinated yeah. and been well, mind she swept. She has, but, but, but she should be in jail now, of right? Of course he should. She and should. have you noticed they've all got names like Phoebe and Cressida and Justin and Torquil. <laughs> These posh girls. <laughs> Middle class hysterics who, who don't actually know what life is really like if you haven't got the bank of mum and dad to support you, yes. and if you have to, uh, uh, find, if you have difficulty paying your electricity bill every month because of the extra cost of renewables that's added on to everybody's bills, and uh, the idea you know, that, uh, uh, that 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 person described as a scientist, almost certainly not a scientist, working for the intergovernmental panel on climate change the clue is in the name it's not a scientific body it's a government body and they're all politicians with their snouts in the trough and uh, the, 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 there's an army of people like them now throughout the world who are sucking on the taxpayers teats and making a fat living out of it traveling to uh, conferences on climate change in places like rio de janeiro and they're traveling uh, on jets of course rather than paddling canoes uh, so uh, what we do know about climate change is because climate change has happened ever since the, the world uh, uh, first was created. Uh, climate change is always with us. Sometimes climate is warming, sometimes it's cooling. At the moment, we are in a period of warming, mild warming. As a result, the planet's getting greener. Uh, a larger part of the planet is able to grow crops in temperate uh, zones than was the case 100 years ago. That's why we can uh, we can feed the vastly increasing population of the planet. Uh, but these facts don't seem to have percolated into no. the heads of people like Phoebe Plummer. No, no exactly. Lock her up, I say. Lock, lock her, her up. up. Lock her up for a very long... I would give her 10 years when she yeah, comes out. Yeah, exactly. We have to stay, start, I, start no making an heating, example. No central heating in the winter in her cell, please. Yes, no. indeed. indeed. Uh, look, on a very sad day, you've brought a little bit of joy back into my life. Neil and Christine Hamilton, the best husband and wife act. Thank you so much for watching Dan Wilson Outspoken. Please do subscribe if you want lots more clips and interviews like that. Plus, if you want to watch our totally uncensored after show, then visit www.outspoken.live.